Hello, everybody. Welcome to Imagination TV. And we're cruising today into an imagination circle with our friends from Learning Planet and a bunch of friends from around the world. And um, I get a little bit of trauma um, doing Imagination TV from this garage because two and a half years ago, we flipped our whole organization into a daily TV show. And it was all done from this garage where we did about 70 odd episodes straight, which I hosted and it included puppeteering with like four different arms at times and madly sitting over in the corner trying to study Paddington Bear's accent so I could do Professor Asterix, who's one of our puppets. So it's like, hello, it's me, Asterix here. And I was nervously playing back Paddington being like, oh, hi, how are you? Oh, hi, Mr. So-and-so. Anyway, um, so sometimes it's quite bizarre to be back here and, and, and to think that, you know, some of the connections that we built, like the connection with the gang at Learning Planet, came through that series of Imagination TV episodes. And, you know, one of the beautiful things on the internet is the capacity to network at speed, um, to build connections across borders, across countries, across races, um, and to move into places where potentially we can we can get movement happening that we need to shift the way things network. So we're I'm really stoked today to be able to kick it with um yeah with our friends at Learning Planet. We've got Ed who's going to help co-host and basically steal the show. How are you going, Ed? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Yeah, excited for this this imaginative session. Yeah, it's going to be good. How are you feeling after COP and the experience of sort of reflecting on on where we're at with climate and with with the challenges and how our global elected leaders sort of went through that process? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's clearly it's uh, you know it's one of the most complex decades that we've had you know in in human history. I think we are suffering and tackling you know uh, a lot of uh, interconnected issues and challenges. But I think with that, what we're finding more and more and more in our work together uh, and in this kind of wider community in the Learning Planet Alliance as well is that you've got to give that space and carve out space for imagination, even in the most uh, extreme challenging circumstances. And, uh, and that's what we're trying to do here today, I think. And I'm just so blessed and grateful to be able to be in this room uh, together and to be with, you know, viewers around the world um, of people that want to carve out a bit more of that space mm. to just try to think about what, goes beyond what can we do to carve out some imagination to carve out new ideas to tackle um some immense challenges that we're we're facing together so it's an amazing group of people um and i think we're going to get started there as well with with an example of this in action so it's your uh first hoodie uh made of seed seed yeah we, of we, we had a play with a um with we were trying to work out you know as we're now navigating actually in the last couple of years ago, we, we've been working with hooded shirts and have hoodies as a common thread between the network that connects people. And we actually built our own economy called Hoodie Economics where you can't buy it. It's earned and exchanged and it becomes this sort of connected tissue. And you're wearing one of them now in, in um, France, I think. And the we were kind of going, okay, how do you make this as meaningful as possible? So we started to think about how to activate the thread. Where does the, the fabric come from? And one of the things we learned was with seaweed, that I think if it's 9% of the Earth's ocean is covered with seaweed farms, it's going to pull out 50 billion tonnes of, of carbon from the atmosphere every year. And so we've tried to find someone make it, who makes a seaweed hoodie um, and we did find someone in Spain and then we're like, okay, how can we use this hoodie to then raise money to reforest the coastline? So we're currently in the process of raising money um, to try and reforest a coastline across all of Sydney's um, coast, so 20-plus beaches, which over the course of 10 years, this group called um, Operation Crayweed can reforest it all. And hopefully it's then a case study as to how we can reforest all our coastlines around the world. And it's done with a hooded sweatshirt. So it's one of the first ever um, seaweed hoodies ever made. It's fully compostable. And, yeah, here's a short video about it, and then we'll come back on the other side and bring some people in.
So this is the world's first hoodie made of seaweed that is entirely compostable. When you're done with it, you can actually put it in your garden and grow vegetables with it. It was made by these legends. And this is the beautiful Sydney coastline. It used to have lots of thriving underwater seaweed forests in it, teeming with marine life until our poorly treated sewerage destroyed it all in the late 1980s. But now, thankfully, the water quality has improved and these awesome scientists have found a way to bring the underwater forests back. So what we do is we take healthy crayweed and we plant it on meshes in deforested rocks and the whole process encourages the seaweed to have heaps and heaps of sex. I'm just gonna stop you right there. If we sell just 2,000 of these hoodies, we can raise enough money to help the scientists reforest the entire Sydney coastline over the next 10 years and provide an example of how reforestation can be done in other coastlines of the world. That's a win for marine life, tourism, carbon sequestration, people who like to breathe oxygen, and let's be honest, the love life of the seaweed. Okay, I'm gonna to have to look up how seaweed actually has sex. So buy a hoodie today, wear it as a badge of honor and tell the world that you helped to regenerate the spectacular underwater forests of Sydney. Amazing. And I can, can confirm that the suit hoodies are very, very cosy as well, which definitely helps. Um, we're going to get started now hearing from, from some of the amazing people in this room and uh, what resonates for them in imagination, in, in thinking about tackling um, climate action. So I'd love just to give the floor first, Selma, uh, if you would like, you've just come back very recently from COP. Could you just uh, introduce yourself in a couple of minutes? Say how you know you are using or thinking about imagination in your climate action. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and for just bringing this up here because um, like addressing it and just keep always uh, setting reminders is what is needed so far. Um, so basically, hi everyone, this is Selma from Algeria, a social and climate youth activist. Uh, I have been taking action so far in terms of fighting climate change because I found that it's it's not only about taking actions, but it's about considering that future that we may not have one day. And that's actually, that's why I would love to bring up here the imagination part where um, like the fact that we keep always like, like kind of predicting that, oh, well, it's it's a global concern and there will be some outcomes that no one can handle and just imagining how worse it may be and how worse it may affect the communities and and how we cannot maybe tackle it and, and like having all of these thoughts and and just imagine the fact that all of this can ruin someone's i would say kids who just started dreaming i mean just keeping in mind that and and like having like so much effect on the on the on people of today and us and then the upcoming generation and and and, and having us here without doing anything is just what makes us always motivated to take more actions because i do believe that um it's true like climate change is a global concern it's too late to just fight it but the, the like to just end it i would say but like fighting it it's still like a hope that everyone is having. And to be honest, like um, we you, we just talked about COPE and we have seen that the youth and children pavilion and no one imagined that this can happen. Like we just, like we used to just put it as a proposal, please one day make it happen. And here we go now implementing this and putting it into action, which is amazing to see. And, and like they, and, and, and to be honest, like it was the, one of the most active, um, pavilions that I have ever seen. It was full of actions, full of creativity. Everyone was there trying to take actions, promote and advocate for uh, new ideas and, and bringing new thoughts. Like we turned art into proposals this time. It wasn't only drafting, but it was performing and 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 just like even the art itself was saying something. And, and like all of this, just like imagining things and then turning it into action is already something that really inspires us a lot. And, and like, the fact that we we made it is is already wow like um 
that's like just one of the examples that I want to give. And it was just recently in Coke. So um, I would say like uh, when it comes to really fighting climate change, the more we simplify it with our new thoughts and, and keeping it just simple to people so they can get it that this is something serious and we need everyone's touch on it. It's not only you should be a scientist or an expert, it's it's for everyone and everyone can always contribute to fighting this global concern. And, and that's the, be the beauty of imagination itself is that if you can imagine that uh, certain tools can help in fighting this global concern, then go for it, promote it, advocate it for people, and we will help in just spreading it and, and making sure that it's implemented in, in all over the world. And, and that's the best part of it, I would say. Um, it was never easy, but the best part is that um, we are making things happen. So I don't know, like it's a question mark, but we are making things happen, it, no matter how hard it may, they may sound, but we made that we made it happen. So yeah, so with um with with that collective uh energy, Selma, it's fascinating to feel the reflection of when you started to speak about making art and the smiles that came in in a really complicated um space which can be really tough to imagine uh, dystopia, to imagine the end of, of life on earth for human beings can be um, really hard to find movement after that. And I think the tension when, when we get stuck in politics and implementation, trying to um, fight and headbutt, which is what you see when political leaders come together, you, you miss the we miss the opportunity to transcend with art and story. And when we go to art, we can make these transcendental leaps, which just that can lift us in a huge, huge way. And I, I think I, my healthy um, challenge would be we need more complexity than simplicity, but we can tell complexity with art and we can tell complexity with big, big stories. And if we can help people understand or feel it doesn't maybe have to be about the words or the, the policy paper if we can move at that feeling, which I feel so um, so importantly energised by the connection to everyone in the generation that's coming in your generation and around us that you know, we just we can keep the move we can keep in movement if we keep in the story um, and this if we keep telling a new story we're very good actors as a species. Like that's what my partner's an actor and I always get very confused when people are like, oh, my gosh, she's a famous actor. I'm like, human beings are the best actors ever. I just went and put this thing on to try and pretend to be a TV host. Like we dress up all the time. We wear our outfits. We have our characters and 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 art allows us to smile and enjoy. Maybe we can find that movement as to what we're fighting for because if we fight for and fight and fight and fight and we're all full with despair and our last breath has no smile then what was the point so i think that's a big tension for us all as we as we try and work through the struggle and fight back maybe with joy Different yeah and selma, selma i mean um you made me think you're i mean it's you're you're you're, you're a hero a heroine in kind of uh this 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 enthusiasm to try to face and tackle the climate crisis we think a lot about um, Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey and the tackle of, you know, fighting um, crisis and going through this journey of seeing a crisis capitalizing. And, and he said, and I saw the quote, the goal of life is rapture and art is the way we experience it. And I feel like you kind of sum that up in an essence there. Um, so thanks so much for, for, for sharing. Um, we'd like to pass over and build on that with uh, Ava from Fridays for the Future. So Ava, for you, uh, you've been in this climate action journey for, for many years now, in this huge, incredible, growing, diverse community. What is imagination for you as part of this journey? Thank you, Ed. So imagination is one of the core values of activism, because why do we do activism? We identify a problem in our reality or something we want to change that requires that we are able to imagine a different reality. We are able to, to have a vision of wanting something different. We claim a different reality. And imagination is the most important part of it because it comes in every single step, you know, um, for many, many years, people wouldn't be able to imagine that climate change would uh, <laughs> would come. And we built a, 
uh, a narrative, a collective narrative, and a way of life we have right now, which have to change. We don't live um, in a sustainable way, and we have to change our collective narrative. And we need imagination to do that. So, yes, I think it's, it's one of the most beautiful things, most beautiful parts of activism. And I think it's the core element of homo sapiens. Ava, as you work through progress and being on the edge of pushing people all the time, um, you know, the it's a difficult thing to wake up every every morning and ask someone to do something uncomfortable. Um, to leave a place they know to a place they don't know. When you receive that friction back, um, how are you finding hope to get up and to keep moving through that fixed friction? What's the way that you've navigated a mindset to to keep going and to to have hope, um, you know, through that process? Mm -hmm. It's not easy, definitely, because we usually get to try and pursuing people much older than us. Um, do things or change things, change their mindset, and they're not always willing to do so. Um, my hope comes for my from my fellow activists uh, and all of you and all these people that are constantly working on changing things. And it's very, very inspiring to feel that you're not alone, that uh, you have people that are sharing your vision or your willingness to your willingness for change so that's what gives me hope and i think it's more than enough to keep me fighting it every day thank you for sharing that yeah i i, I feel like the fragility of these intangibles like imagination and hope like it's a i think about um the American president who said we're going to put a, a man on the moon in 10 years' time is just like one of the craziest story arcs ever. And NASA was hardly even set up to like, you know, fly off the ground. And I think those big jumps, like that's what I urge urge you all to keep pushing us to make huge quantum jumps. And if the if you keep pushing the bar, um, you know, and we, we go, we need to do get you know we need to go to the equivalent of putting a person on the moon and we need to do it in 10 years and hopefully we accelerate to where we thought the target was which was maybe seven out of a hundred you know and i think that's the that's the opportunity where collectively if we keep hatching across nation states if we keep hatching across different ages and races and backgrounds the network will lift the value and that's how we shift the economy because the beauty of economics is it's where we put our time it's where we put our attention. It's not where we put our dollars. That follows as a transaction. Our time, our attention, and and what we value in terms of knowledge and, and examples like this are ways that we start to shift the attention and shift the economic value. And then politicians follow that. They follow where the attention goes. So, um, yeah, just thank you. And thank you both for the work that you're doing. And, um, you know, we're picking up the notes to do everything we can as well and follow and, and run with you. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, and I think for both of us, you know, what 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 really resonates for me is, you know, you're both incredible young game changers. You've done a lot already, um, and there's a huge amount that you know um, now to pass on, and it's passing on up the generations as well because you're living it so early in your in your lives and your careers. And and for us, I mean, at, at Learning Planet, you know, we set up, for instance. Uh, a year back the the youth fellows the community of youth fellows for us it's trying to take the idea of fellows and say you know we often think of this as being old professors the fellows of a university but actually in this case um that 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 is that's dying out as a principle because the fellows are those that are from the very beginning of their lives tackling and pushing to see the world differently and to 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 address the world uh you know in in imaginative ways and the challenges uh that have been imposed on them as well and so uh you know eva and selma have been you know, incredible youth fellows among the huge hundreds of other initiatives that they've mobilized themselves and that they're part of and we're always trying to build bridges with these initiatives and building another bridge just now to tunisia where i think we're going to be 
hearing or seeing a video of one of our other wonderful youth fellows, Selim, uh, who will be sharing a bit more about what imagination is for him in his climate action journey. Hello everyone, I am Selim Hamouda. I'm a youth climate and education activist in Tunisia. So activism is identifying a need within our community and choosing to work on it with the different stakeholders so we can collectively find a solution for that problem. And I think um, imagination plays a big role in all of that since it is the first step of activism, especially when talking about the, the, the climate issue. Also, imagination allows you to set your aim as an activist, answering questions like where do you want to go or what's the finality you want to achieve. So that's how it helps. Imagination sculptures and gives you the outline of what, you, what to do as an activist. And that has personally helped since I have always imagined um, my community to be a youth-led community where young people are taking actions and initiatives for a more sustainable life which motivated me to organize training sessions and workshops just to real realize that aim. And I think that's the case for a lot of people, either someone who's imagining his city's corporations making more sustainable choices or more environmental friendly productions or decisions. And even international organizations, they all started with imagination. For example, the United Nations or um, any international organization, they all started with with having a certain imagination of the world and then conducting, conducting studies and making strategies and action plans just to realize that vision of the world. So, for example, the SDGs, they all started as an imagination of a, a more sustainable world. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Salim, and I'm also very sorry that Australia beat Tunisia in the World Cup. Um, and, yeah, I'm was cheering for Australia to win in that game. Uh, yeah, I find it fascinating that we've got this like superpower as a species. Um, and then I wonder where it goes in our, in our education practice or in our training or in our consciousness after, you know, our, our youth as we kind of move forward. And Lena, really excited to have you join us and, and share some of your work um, as you go through the process of kind of weaving your introduction. What, what happens to imagination along the way, do you think, you know, as we, because as we reflect on it, like Salim said, like it just seems obvious it's the beginning of all of our thought. It's the beginning of every idea. It's the beginning of every act. It's how we make a map. It's how we work out how to move. Why is it not a practice that's in our pedagogy all the way through learning? Why is it not carved out in workplaces? Um, yeah, what do you think? Tell us about yourself in that process as well. It's lovely to have you here. Absolutely. Hi, Jack. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Lena. I'm the campaign and participation advisor for the Earth Rule Initiative. So we are a big campaign and political advocacy project. And I think the way we use Im uh, imagination relates the most to what Eva said about creating this, this collective public discourses to then trigger public action and, and political action. It's about breaking with, with the past and all these ideas are very damaging, not only on a climate perspective, but also when you think about how inequality has been absolutely exploding and uh, poverty has been increasing too. So it's really about using imagination to, to create this kind of new chapter of humanity altogether. And it's this huge cultural shift. So you were talking about COP, for example, and um, when you have, say, Maya Motley talking about a climate mitigation trust, or where we, as a as a political advocacy group, um, we talk about how high income countries should uh, cancel all debt to low income countries. Fantastic, but th these are concepts that are actually really hard to grasp in relation. To how will that affect our lives um, as humans, as a community, as a society on this planet? And so the work that we are doing. Um, as part of the kind of uh, public facets of our work is about creating these, these stories and these narratives about how we are facing a choice now. We're at a really transformational moment where we can go on with our little life uh, as we're doing kind of business as usual and we can go somewhere or we can take this giant leap and there's this crazy actions that are actually not that crazy at all and go somewhere else. So the way we are using um, this imagination as a tool is actually by 
to, uh, creating these fictional characters that are born just now in this transformational moment in the middle of the pandemic in 2020 and unfolding, really unpacking the journeys in two completely different scenarios, this business as usual or this giant leap, because this makes uh, these futures not this, this, this very distant thing that we don't really care about. It's about making it personal and how all these numbers and statistics that we hear at Cuff actually affect the lived experiences of, of real people. It's about imagination, is about making all these concepts really relatable on a personal level. And I think that's how you can use it the best to move forward. 100%. I, 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 I want to tell a story with you. So please if, follow up, uh, let, let us write or jump in with some puppets or put us in the game in that playground. That sounds like a, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see if we can help out. And what a great do. So We are crowdsourcing quite a bit uh, on yeah. small shops in what we call a course of voices. We're asking people, you know, especially one of my favorite exercises is going through this demonstration organized by Friday for the Future Extension Rebellion and asking people, you know, you have this very concrete ask on a sign, systems change, not climate change, but what, what is this future that you're imagining that you're fighting for? What is it that you want out of all this effort that you're putting it as an activist, as someone who demands something for politics? So absolutely, um, uh, we, we have lots of groups that are engaging with us already and, and help us to create this new narrative for this new vision for the future, because that's what we need, this common message and this collective action to be able to move forward. Yeah, big time. Sorry, Em. No, no, it, absolutely. And I mean, um, in back in September, uh, our friends from the uh, from Arizona State University hosted uh, the Global Futures Conference, bringing leaders around the world, thinking about what is the futures that what are the futures that we're looking for. And I think one of the things that came out, or that they were saying, really resonated is we need to take the time to weave the stories of change. You know. Um, this is stuff that you've got to push. And, you know, you say, you know, with Earth Rule, it's like, you know, we need to weave the story for the new economy. You know, we need to make this stuff um, pop and be exciting and be compelling. And um, it might be a good segue as well to just hear from a quick video from Rebecca from uh, Ethics Sustainability Team who can apply this to impact funds and to funding and creating the story for funding change. So over to Rebecca on the video. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Rebecca. I live in New York City, so unfortunately won't be joining you all today. Um, but uh, thank you for having me and I'll, sh I'll share a few um, thoughts from my work on imagination um, and what we're working on and hopefully that sparks a great conversation that I can join in the future. Um, so at Ethic, uh, we're a company based in New York doing sustainable investing, uh, and we're looking at a really, what I think is a really interesting problem set where basically um, what we've observed is that investing has ingrained concepts of what we value that lead um, investors and companies to think about short-term profit over a long-term, more, more holistic version of sustainability and impacts to people and the planet. Um, so there's a lot of really, really interesting elements of that. But really what we're working at uh, in the long term is how can we use finance as a way to realign people with what they value? Um, what does sustainability mean to everyone and how can we bring um, investment and what we think of as financial, creating financial value um, back in line with what it means to live on a sustainable planet? Um, Within the realm of ethic, I personally uh, build technology products, um, looking specifically at sustainability and impact, um, which I think is a, is a really cool ro role because it requires a ton of imagination. There's a, a core to my role is imagining different ways that we can solve problems and challenging the ways that uh, traditionally financial systems have solved them or tra traditionally technology has solved them and, and using bringing together a bunch of different perspectives um, to reimagine what the future could look like. Um, when I think about imagination in my work, um, I think a lot of it is about um, when you have a set of old problems, uh, they need new solutions. And I think the bridge from doing things the way that they were into new ways of thinking is a, a lot of imagining new solutions and challenging the way that things should be. Um, and especially um, in finance and financial systems, uh, bringing out concepts of fairness and joy and curiosity uh, into these systems that um, have suppressed it. 
Um, I think one of the things we're looking at a lot at the moment at Ethic is um, around nature and how do we value, um, how do we realign what we think of as value with nature and creating harmony between humans and nature. Um, and ultimately with the goal of changing financial, financial systems uh, to sh shift the world towards thinking about more comprehensive and imaginative view um, that values uh, harmony between humans uh, and nature uh, with financial systems that goals are, are aligned um, with protecting that in the long term. Um, so just a really quick overview of what we're we're up to and what I think about in my day to day. And um, thank you for having me and hopefully meet you all soon. Awesome. Rebecca, thanks for joining us. And I'm sorry that I didn't get to playing you in that game of tennis. We were too busy trying to work out how to redesign the financial system together and design a nature fund. So, yeah, I, what I'm excited about is, you know, seeing what the gang at Ethic are doing and some of the, the other major, major financial players. We've been working with them over the last couple of years and designing a nature fund where you centre a financial tool around nature and you don't have carbon offsets as a way that finance can spin off, that actually we think about our central relation um, with nature in real time, what our relation with indicator species looks like, what our, um, and I think this is where it gets really exciting for me, when we start to uh, learn patterns from deep Indigenous systems patterns, which I'm lucky enough to be connected to, the longest continuous um, surviving culture in the world, uh, which are Aboriginal people in Australia. So I'm Aboriginal through my mum's side and my family. And I've been lucky enough to have this knowledge passed on through Indigenous systems thinkers. And to summarise something very complex to the, the, the conversation we were having earlier, Selma, like we've had these patterns for a very, very long time where we're just mapped in relation to nature. I've got a, a totem called Janban, which is a platypus. Now, on the woo-woo scale, my sister's probably a little bit more woo-woo than, than I am, but I, you know, I'm not sure if all of my ancestors actually end up as a platypus, but I'm definitely not going to mess with the water where that platypus lives. And when we're mapped in relation to species and when we start to understand that actually nature is our libraries of long stories, so we have song lines here which have carried for 60,000 years and that's where our knowledge is mapped. So in terms of big stories, that's how you tell big stories. It's not in an eight second TikTok video or it's not in a, you know, two minute like quick thing that sits on a, on a spiral reel and disappears. When you map it to nature with nature, with long, deep narratives in long, deep time, then it's not going to go away. It's always going to sit there and we'll find it um, in different playgrounds. So that's what I'm most hopeful for. You know, it's dancing in the belly of the beast in New York with a bunch of like money people. But I believe that the gang at Ethic like have enough of a grab on a moral and an ethical code that they're really um, desperate to try and see if we can crack how we get Indigenous systems thinking to the front of the design queue um, on a financial tool. And if we can crack a code with one lever there, as Selma and Ava and everybody as a team, we keep moving people like hopefully we start to move an ecosystem and make some quantum jumps and leaps. So yeah, that's that's where we're at. We'll share a little bit of this nature fund video, and then we'll we'll jump into our next um next gang. So this summarizes the work that we're doing with the nature fund and the Indigenous Knowledge Systems Labs out of Australia. And we've got um yeah, Dr. John Davis. I think he's a doctor. If not, John, you're a doctor in my mind. I'll give you a doctorate from Imagination Uni. Um, John Davis is going to join us in the circle in three months' time. A beautiful Indigenous Systems thinker who's been helping with this, and a, and a bunch of other wonderful people from Australia. So. Here's the Nature Fund video and then we'll come back and catch up with a, another um, group of people.
just taking a breath off that video. Um, I'm loving the art that's on display here, the different ways of recounting these stories of change as well. Um, yeah, it's it really is an inspiration. Um, I think what is coming up as a big, a bigger and bigger theme in this chat, and we're seeing in the videos as well, is you know what are these new narratives? What stories are we trying to weave that go bigger? Uh, than what's the obvious um and i would love briefly um to bring in uh olivier you've been working so much around weaving new narratives that that take and bring together people from so many different areas that might not otherwise find that chance or find that need to work together and you know what is the the the, the new narrative for you of imagination uh, in climate action so thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to relate very quickly to what has already been shared, but uh, 15 years all over the world meeting with incredible people, so of all ages, the youth, but not only the youth. I mean, trying to change things, being very involved. This gives a very strong enthusiasm. I think I relate to Eva, what you were saying. This is a sufficient fuel to, su to see fuel to see so many people trying to do things. What I think has been missing are real imaginative narratives that we can relate to and, and, and do things and some if you just get together to fight to be an activist against something that's something strong but it, it won't take you far enough so really imagining this new narrative so i, I just want to give one example then and it's not mine i've, I've worked a lot on in, in, uh, narratives of things that work on the ground that you can replicate and collaborate in the collective dimension but at the time being we're trying to take it at another level and I think that since Francois working with us is has been working a lot about how do we reinvent citizenship, global citizenship, uh, enlightenment, how do we relate enlightenment and the story of enlightenment to traditional wisdom, because, you know, move away from an occidental dimension. And by doing this, doing this, getting very deep into this, then the idea came of, oh, why not say that we are planetizens and not citizens, and planetizens unite all citizens, as well as all the children that do not have you know, legal rights to vote, but also all the living spaces. And if you think of humanity as planet citizens, if you think of the UN as not United Nations with different citizenships, but what could it be if it was a really open uh, planet citizen dimension? Uh, I think you start to shift radically the way you, you, you think about it. Um, and these are the kind of narratives, there are others, and I think the imagination space the imagination university these are other spaces but really to go for radically new narratives and when they start going when you start bringing in people the collective intelligence behind it rather than the hero journey for me i mean i'm very much into seeing the process of how do we co-construct these stories so i stop here i hope it is clear but it's really about looking about narratives that are radically different opening possibilities and making these realistic utopia making them happen there's, there's hundreds of, I think it's like beings of other species we, we share this rock with. And it's such a critical point to how we think about our value and where our value lies. Like we think that we've made advancement to go into human-centered design, which is sort of the phase that we're in. It's one of the things I've been talking to Johnny about a lot, who's a co-founder of Ethic. Nature-centered design is the only way. It's long systems have taught us that. That's what Indigenous systems have done in Australia and when you centre around the planet, when you centre around an economic model with billions of billions of species, like the number when you when you like look up how many species are on planet Earth, it's like an unfathomable number. And that's that's life. That's all the other life. And us, we're a translator at best. Like what I've been taught is um, we're, we're at best custodians. Our role is to be relational connectors to help translate all the species and to be in relation together. And I think as you were talking, Olivier, I think um, one of the, the the things I've learned in the last like 20 years of trying to organise change, starting when I was 17 and, and growing this thing around the world to work in 52 countries and creating a university and now about to, like, you know, create a country to hopefully help give us a network to scale up some of these, these bright spots around the world is don't stop at the stop signs when people tell you to stop at the stop signs with storytelling and specifically i've found in the last like 12 months when people are like that's complex i'm like no it's not the earth is spinning at a million miles an hour or sorry a thousand miles an hour right now as we're talking on a tilt and that's one thing you know how does air sit above water like you know I do all of these unbelievable complex things that happen that we take for granted 
and then to take people and hold their hand into the complexity. And I think if we're going to tell the stories that move people, they have to go richer and richer. That's what those big periods of, of artistic creation command from us. Um, don't stop at the stop sign when people say, oh, this is hard to take in because you're scratching the surface. Run through the thousand other doorways and then, then jump off a cliff and fly and skydive and, and then tell a story from there. And then they'll catch up. You know, they'll go around a different way. But if you if you stop at the snakes and ladders, you'll just end up always in this political implementation battle. And I think that's the opportunity. Yeah, Jack, and I'm jumping in, and when I, uh, I stop, but really also the spaces that allow for imagination to grow and thrive. Why and all the classrooms, some imagination factories and labs, whoever then kind of learning something top down from the past, which is an imposed narrative, take a uh, uh, I mean, some books talking about humankind being mean and fighting each other. There are so many narratives that we can shift. And how do we make sure that the spaces are artistic, scientific places of exploration of the frontiers of knowledge and of know-how? And if we multiply these spaces for imagination at the local level, and then we have online spaces or other, it's not channels, it's not TV, media, really. It's not something which goes in one direction. It is taking the time to imagine things differently, cultivating this talent. So I think having big narratives and having the practice of imagination locally Schools can play a great role. I don't think they are today. Big time. Yeah, I was, I was talking when Edson, we're about to bring you in to, um, to reflect on, on your, your journey and what you're doing at the moment. And, you know, I was talking this morning to a, um, someone doing wonderful work in, in LA who grew up with, you know, a really like powerful arc of a story. And he's like, oh, I, I see fractals in the world, you know, and he's gone off and had psychedelic experiences in his life. And, you know, you don't need a psychedelic experience. You go and look at the inside of a flower. Like it is wild, you know, for design systems, you look up uh, to the trees that are behind Edson and you're like, wow, look at how nature maps. And then you look at our strategic plans or our GDP or our measurement scores, and they don't have any of the life or complexity of the webs of nature. And they're the big jumps from a design frame because you yeah, you reclaim the space in the school to go outside and it's the greatest imagination teacher we've got. Edson, tell us a little bit about the work you're doing and um, and how imagination sort of sits for you and thank you for joining us on the show. Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Can hear you well, yes, thank you. Okay, okay. So basically, uh, I teach in, in Chirezi, uh, which is located located in the uh, southern part of Zimbabwe. It's actually uh, agro region five, which means uh, this region receives little to no rainfall. So I came here at this school some two years ago. And what I've realized and what I've witnessed was uh, the devastating effects of, of climate change within the school and the, the surrounding communities. And what was worrisome was that, uh, uh, to my point of view, nothing was being done, especially to address maybe issues to do with the, with the, with the kids. Because at the end of the day, the ones uh, receiving the, 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 the most um, effects of climate change are the children. And it's, it, it, it's saddening to note that little to, uh, to nothing is being done as far as empowering or as far as equipping uh, these kids with the necessary survival uh, uh, skills as far as the future is concerned. So imagination is one of the biggest catalysts of change. If we are to talk of any change in systems, the first thing is to imagine. So uh, me, after realizing all the, the impacts of climate change, the droughts, the effects to the livelihood of the local communities, I said, how best can I equip or how best can I develop adaptation skills to the little kids? So I, I, I formed a club called Learners in the Fight Against Climate Change. So in this club, I, I try by all means to, to, to marry whatever we, we do in the, in the classroom, that is theory, to practice. Because what, what is lacking in, in the world order of today is the practical part or the practicability of these theoretical aspects we teach these kids every day. So now I formed this club in order maybe to, to, 
to, to, to enlighten the kids. What really is this animal called climate change? Where is it coming from? How is it affecting them each and every day? And how best can we as kids play a role? I believe uh, the, this climate crisis must be centered around the kids because we are saying they are representing the future. Imagination, ch children imagine almost every day of their life. They use imagination from imaginary friends to even making up games. So if we leave them behind, as far as climate change fight is concerned, then we are doing a disservice to the society, to the community and to the future as a whole. So now in this club, we do a lot of activities, which includes uh, food preservation, because this is a drought region. So we try by all means to contextualize our, our adaptation and our mitigation measures. So during the dry season, which means there's a lot of problems with relish, so we do food preservation. We've got a nice nutritional garden where we practice conservation agriculture. We also do tree plant and protection. We have got this plastic issue around our community shops. So we, we use these plastic bottles, these empty plastic bottles to ornament our flower beds and decorate our, our pathways. We have got a biodiversity extinction problem. So we, we have developed a, a Mwenje a seed bank, whereby I always encourage these guys to move around collecting seeds, indigenous and exotic. All these activities are centered on imagination. What do you imagine the future to be like? A treeless society, so what do we do? We protect the trees. A future without biodiversity, so what do you do? You create seed banks. A future without water, what do you do? We harvest water. So this was my imagination. So how best can we equip our children? How best can we equip our teachers, our society, our community leaders with the necessary information? We use imagination. All our life, past, present, future is centered on imagination. Imagination gives or yields create creative thinking. Imagination gives us the power to redesign our how we do business each and every day. You talk of business, you talk of our art, our arts industry, you talk about our, our marketing, you talk about media, you talk about education, everything is centered on imagination. Because we are trying to address or to readdress the effects, the negative effects we we as human beings we have done to the society. So how do you do that? We reimagine everything. So basically, that's how I'm doing it down Zimbabwe. Thank you. Ed, I just want to link you link you to together as part of what I think, um, Edson. The one thank you for your effort and and action and the 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 reality of that of taking those big concepts and making them practical. And I think you take that imagination, as you said, you find then design methods to go, how do we design action or behaviours that can shift out what happens? And then where I get excited is a group like Learning Planet and a coalition of different people say, okay, well, here is a case study and then let's have, you know, 100,000 seed banks um, through 100,000 school clubs that are, you know, facilitated and mentored by Edson, and then we get ourselves systemic change, is when we start to move from these silos to then being interconnected, and if we have limitations in our country, we can, other countries can move quicker, and that's what I think is really exciting about the potential of, of the network um, and, and networking in unlikely ways, and and that's where I, I think the power and potential of Learning Planet bringing people together is, is a chance to scale up those initiatives of those bright spots and, and provide that connective tissue. Thanks so much, Jack. Yeah, 100%. And, um, you know, forgive me for a cliche, but Edson, you, you, you just keep making me think of you're planting seeds. You're planting seeds, you know, that are leading to immense growth in terms of nature. And then you're planting seeds, you know, uh, particularly through the community and particularly through your emphasis on hearing through children that are leading to adding to the cliche this cross-pollination you know of ideas of insights of plants 
and um and i'm completely with you jack that you know that's sometimes the most spectacular way of reminding us you know the sheer beauty that is on the earth is just seeing what grows from these seeds um both in the figurative and in the physical sense so thanks edson for helping to weave this picture and and i think as a perfect kind of transition from what you've been sharing it'd be great to give give the voice to wangi and to cheryl uh, from the children in freedom school in kenya who from the beginning of their education are using imagination to uh to imagine uh you know new systems new ways of thinking and of learning and i think you're going to be starting just with a video that helps to weave this picture um before you guys uh, introduce yourselves my name is Cheryl Mavoni, 13 years of age. We are both from Children in Freedom School, which is the first Afrocentric school in Eastern Africa. And when I grow up, I would like to become a pharmacist. My name is Angoy Faith from Children in Freedom School. And when I grow up, I would like to become a doctor, 13 years of age. And our message today is reconnecting back with nature, our planet. Think about this. Earlier last month, the World Health Organization issued a global alert on four cough syrups that were found to contain a toxic substance that was linked to acute kidney injuries. These syrups cost over 200 deaths in Indonesia and 70 deaths in Gambia. Do our children really deserve to die like this? How many more children are going to die due to our negligence? Really, Modern, I weep for these children. In the past, if there were such cases of common cold or cough, Africans used to treat them very easily using locally available herbs that were non-toxic, natural and organic but effective. These herbs include the rosemary, basil leaves, mint leaves, cinnamon or ginger root, among others. When it, when it came to insecticide and pesticides, we used to use natural, effective, non-lethal, lethal and non-toxic herbs. Example, the pyrethrum, the night blooming jasmine, among others. These plants are growing vast and are available in Africa. In fact, other Africans are still using these natural and effective herbs to use in their homes because they are effective and they don't have they, they don't have advanced signs and symptoms. Big farm international or big pharmaceutical company, companies come for their raw materials in Africa because Africa has the best raw materials. Here in Children in Freedom School, we are trying to enable children to reconnect back to their ancestral roots and their cultures. We are all custodians of nature and so we should take care of it. Return to nature, re-embrace nature. Cheryl and Wangu, do you want to keep going? Tell us, tell us about the work you're doing and, um, and thank you for, for sharing that video. So here in Children in Freedom School, we are educating other children across the world about these hubs and how they are used and how to, how to use them well. And we hope that the other children in the world are still doing it. This video was to put across a message that we should all take care of nature because nature has always provided us with everything from food to medicine and even water. So from the history of humanity, it is evident that our generation today has disconnected from nature. We all need to come back to nature and re-embrace it. We can all do this through our imagination because imagination is the key to everything. Imagination builds curiosity, motivate, and even motivation. Imagination influences everything we do, think, and even create. So imagination is the key to innovation. Thank you. I have one, one quick, simple question. Um, I've been trying to work out um, where dreams come come from you know when you go to we go to sleep and and we have a dream um do either of you know where dreams come from from our imagination and do you like how do you make a dream you just have to like visualize it in your mind and like set a goal towards it because imagination is everything 
and everything we think of we can become. Yes. And when you when you think when you both think ten years from now, um, the big jumps you want to see in the world. What are you imagining? What are you when you're going to sleep and you're dreaming or you're putting those dreams into real life? What's the story you want us to bring to life on on planet Earth ten years from now? Ten years from now, I can think that maybe we can reduce our carbon emissions and we can we can start planting indigenous trees and even exotic trees and also we reduce the the rate of oil spillage maybe and the rate of yeah i think that's a good vision i am um, practically would love to to see how we could learn from the school and and plug you all in to to help some people working on some of these systems change. So I'll um I'll follow up with our team and and I think the team at Ethic who are trying to design this big money nature fund from the world should um should take some time and listen to the students at your school and listen to you both and see if your design thinking can help shape the process so we we get it right this time round. And as you both said so well, the knowledge is here. We've we've just been breaking it open um, with extractive measures and if we work with Earth. If we work with nature, um, then we'll find harmony in the way that we're meant to move. So thank you both for, for joining us. Um, and thank you for your imagination and keep bringing us with you and telling big stories. Yeah, so so touched. I, there's there's applause, there's people clapping, I think, in the room. Um, there's so much to, to, to take and to be inspired from from what you're sharing. And we, I think we've got about 15 minutes left of this call, but I think I want it to keep going on and on and on. Um, but it would be great just to open up to, to a popcorn round of, of those of you that are in the room with us, you know, um, maybe starting with you, Salma, you know, what what you, you spoke at the beginning, what do you, do you learn or take from this session today and this discussion on imagination in, in climate action? And what do you want to take with you coming out of the call? Um, to be honest, um, just I just like I forgot to mention something. I just remembered it. Uh, <laughs> actually, like when I see that COVID came and then now people forgot about it. And then I remember that the only way we fought it was to do quarantine. And I was like always imagining why we cannot do the same for climate change, why we cannot do quarantine, where people would just respect everything. And and we will just make sure that we need to stick to certain practices because that hurts the environment and hurts planet. So we need to embrace that. We need quarantine, but this time for climate change. So I don't know, like I was thinking of this, like I was imagining it and I was like, it, it can work if we really insisted and if the entire world were, would just embrace it. And that's like a question mark. It's just, it just came out, you know, it's just, it's all about imagining this right now. And, and, um, and after just seeing the sacrifices that everyone is making, and, and I remember like in COPE, literally we were drafting statements and we were all sitting there in the venue till 4 a.m., <laughs> not in the venue, like, and then we go back to the hotel, work on the statements for till 4 or 5 a.m. and then go back at 8 and, and work again and present them and, and have our side events. Like we saw youth taking over and we saw youth proving that we got this. And, and we saw youth proving that Trusting us does worth it and, and we can do a lot because we, our generation doesn't, doesn't know what impossible is. And we just believe that we can just do things and implement them as long as we can write them down, as long as we can say them. So why not just putting them into action? And, and that's all, like, that's what we do believe in. And I, and like, and I hope like, um, like starting from now and and I hope like our generation will understand this and we'll teach this to the upcoming generations because we're already having children here and and that's just amazing to have you here with us because uh we saw like um for example in cope like there was like this one Kenyan girl that would love I'm talking about her like everywhere in every interview and she literally like she planted thousands of trees in 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 Kenya and she was talking and like one of she met one of the decision makers who took her to this 
uh, area where decision makers are. And she was talking about uh, how the, the work she was doing and how hard it is. And she asked them, please stop cutting trees because it's really requires a lot of efforts and it's exhausting. And, and just her talking like spontaneously and it, like she's just an innocent kid who just took this like seriously and and they ended up just funding her thousands of dollars i mean that's not that's not the point but the point is that kids are noticing too and we don't want them to just keep that in mind we want to show them that we got this we are trying to make solutions and we need your help and we need everyone's help and we need everyone's support and again as you guys said who is keeping us is the people who are trusting us and the people who are supporting us uh, i saw a mom she i have seen her in every conference actually and and she was all time like there trying to support us uh trying to just like complement our work and that's already enough to be honest and i think that's what is keeping all of us and i'm sure that most of you agree with me sorry for taking over but i really wanted to say that thank you so much again Thelma, thanks so much um what i think you're you've been uh sharing and pushing and what seems to be coming up more and more and more is this you know we can build this collective imagination together, these collective dreams together, and it's kind of on us to choose how we make them positive. Um, I don't know, you might have read the book Sapiens, but uh, I really, the quote that, um, that that Hari mentions, there are no gods, no nations, no money, no human rights, except in our collective imagination. And it's our choice what we take as being collective imagination for bad and what we take as being collective imagination for good and for change and for action. Um, Ava, did you want to just um, rebound on this? You know, what's maybe a nugget or something that you want to carry with you um, into your day and into your activism ahead? I totally agree with you about the collective narratives. And I think that you know, narratives are very useful. They help us to to live collectively and they help us survive in this planet. <laughs> they are very bad things also on this planet. But I think that we tend to overbelieve these narratives sometimes. We tend to have the perception of the world was like this, like we found it like from ever, forever. And um, it's in our hand to change that. I really want to thank you all because uh, it was an amazing session and you made me think of different perceptions of imagination. Imagination as innovation, uh, political narratives, but also in terms of uh, empathy. Um, we have to be more coordinated and more... Uh, in that with nature. I'm also very impressed by these girls from Children and Freedom. They're a very good reminder to us to listen to kids. Um, thank you all. That's my takeaway. Thank you, Ava. Um, yeah, thank you for the the rich energy and the smiles like sometimes that is more powerful than than any other force we have um together across borders and through these tiny little um screens that we get to connect on the va any reflections have been in this in and you know seeing these circles start to emerge um and these unlikely connections from inside and outside systems and across borders and yeah how are you feeling as you've been seeing through this experience Uh, yeah, they're not. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think something that's frustrating me in general is that we have lots of narratives and movies and books about um, our journey as humanity into disasters, into apocalyptic situations. We don't have the narratives where we're actually making it out just fine at the other end of the tunnel. That's immensely frustrating. We don't have this in the public discourse, but discussions like this remind you that these visions for the future do exist. And you have to go grassroots to find them, but they are here and we need to find solutions to bring them up and to make them part of the public discourse um, so that they can trigger this collective action that everyone's been talking about. Uh, I think that's going to be my main takeaway from this session, just keeping on diversifying voices and going, um, yeah, digging everywhere to, to find these discourses that we so need today. 
Yeah, bring on the hope news, I think, and like the kindness feed and that where stocks are up with platypus and stocks are up with the great whale and that we start to actually get away from, I think the bizarre thing about the financial system and some of the patterns we've inherited is they are the most abstract thing ever. Everything that everyone's talking about now is actually very centred. And so when you looked at like you're crazy because this, as I think Ava was saying earlier, because what we've inherited is so odd and abstract. Actually, what everyone talking about here is very considered, thoughtful, anchored with long intelligence um, through it. It's not a gnarly activist like position. It's actually just a really thoughtful, considered way for us to think about how to navigate life on earth together as a big um, group of human beings. And I think that's important to remember as well as we all go through this work. The crazy people are the ones that have designed what we've inherited. Um, we're not crazy. Uh, so yeah, Cheryl and and Wangu, if, if you want to next time we um we do this TV show, maybe you can take my job and and be the host. Would you like to do that in three months' time and and step in and host the next circle that we do? Yes. Good. Good news. You can take my job too if you'd like it. It's a tiring job. <laughs> Very cool. Does anyone else like to share any final reflections before we wrap up? Cheryl or Wangu, is there anything that you'd like to, to share to reflect reflect on um, on your time here? I would like to to add on about that of imagination because there was one time a boy in this school just went round the round the market and then saw that the market was that and then came to the director and told him that we should take part in cleaning the community and that is when the boy ah that is when our school started cleaning the market and also we have visited orphanages and participated in visiting in part, participated in visiting or feeding them. Our school has also planted multiple trees, both indigenous and exotic throughout the past months. So we should take something from this and we should all plant at least a hundred trees in every country to, to be able to like create the environment and make us closer to nature because many pharmaceutical companies this nowadays are, are, are cutting down trees for building more industries. And it has been recorded that in the past years that the ozone layer has started to deplete because of like the refrigerations, gases from industries, yeah. Every student in the world plants a tree, feels like an important part of the school curriculum and just, just the base level, one tree a year for each year you get of schooling one tree a year for each class that you teach as a teacher, one tree a year for each uh, paycheck you take as an employee, one tree a year for each person that you employ as an employer. And then suddenly we start to balance out the ledger a little bit. Thank you both so much for your time, Ed. Would you like to, um, to start to segue towards the end of this wonderful um, train ride of imagination we've been on? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a, a joy. It's been a, a blessing to be to be part of this conversation and to be able to think and and learn from just some 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 genuine uh, role models in this room as well and around the world on you know how uh, they carve out that space for imagination in some of the biggest challenges that we face in the world. Um, just to, to close as well and say um, we are trying to put imagination into conversations on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis around how we transform uh, education so that it's best equipped to really tackle, you know, the major, major, major challenges of our time. In uh, end of January, um, we'll be having Imagination TV sessions running through the whole week of our Learning Planet Festival, a global celebration of learning to take care of oneself, others in the planet. Be over 500 events hosted in local communities and online around the world. Uh, hundreds of, of speakers, hackathons, um, community events, model UNs, roundtables, you name it. But what we want to make sure we do this year is, is a value that comes through all of it. It's youth-centered and it's imaginative. And so through every one of our action tracks throughout the week, 
there's going to be um, an Imagination TV uh, session looking at uh, education uh, at the margins for refugees, um, for nonviolence, uh, in the classroom itself, and truly weaving together wisdom and science for imaginative futures. So there's going to be lots of conversations. We'd love to have you with us to join this journey. And uh, we'll play out the session today with a quick highlights reel from some other amazing people and friends uh, using imagination in the day to day to make the change we want to see in the world. And so as we're, that, as we're, as like we're about that. to jump to that one, Ed, I'll just um, see if Edson wants to wants to reflect on anything before we jump. Edson, have you got any final words before we before we jump off this um, rocket ship? Okay, okay. Oh, thank you so much uh, uh, for letting me share my my piece of story and maybe it will have some ripple effects in, in our, our own local context. And also maybe uh, as far as education is concerned. So I think maybe it's now high time we, 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 we make or we center education at the center of this uh, climate crisis. If we are saying it's it's affecting the future, so why why not shifting? Why not make a paradigm shift from our like let's make it the new normal climate education. Let's make it the new normal. Let's shift our our our, our educational policy, our environmental policies. Let's start. Let's we can even go back to the kids. They've got an amazing uh, way of solving things. In them, they carry this natural. Uh, seeds of of change so what whatever we do as adults we, we borrowed it from the from the kids so let's start there and maybe we can be in in harmony with with nature we we as adults we are now corrupted with greedy we are egocentric we are self-centered so if we go to these kids they have got undiluted minds they've got creative thinking so if if you can see how these kids, especially my 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 kids are, are small from ECD to to grade seven, which is the five four year olds. If you see them doing these activities with nature, you you will be amazed. So I think we we need to go back now to the to those are the basics. So I think education is is it, it's got these seeds of maybe doing a, our nature a, a favor. Thank you. Thank you, Edson, and um, and I think one of the the most powerful pieces which I think we we have to try and do if we want to lead to systemic change is the imagining is one part and the doing is the other part, and working out what are the levers that we can pull in in this multiplicity of crazy systems that we all play within as a species, let alone the other ones um, that we interact with with all the non-human entities. And I think about the example of, you know, what you've offered there, Edson, we could go one route, which is, you know, get every educational government to approve a new curriculum. And that could take, you know, 10 years for us to do that. Or teachers to every teacher around the world, here's your curriculum. And if you wash a climate um, frame in front of the curriculum, then you can change it immediately and you can still achieve seven times seven. We can do that, but it can be seven seeds times seven seeds that you go out and plant physically during your lesson and you can work with the inherited system that we've got and we can put climate action and we can put the connection and relationship to nature in the centre of our educational experience. Now, that is available to any teacher in the world that does what you've been doing, Edson, which is taking your imagination and going, well, we can do that. And then if you want to push it a little bit more, I mean, the worst you're going to do is maybe lose your job at that school and then become a global celebrity for being a teacher that actually pushed the, um, pushed the, pushed the bandwidth and moved this as a way that we need to move. So I think there's a big, big scope for teachers to say, you are there to be our custodians. You are there to be our mentors. We are all looking to you, school teachers, and there is a way that you can navigate it with what's inherited with the pressure that governments will catch up on. You can help do that tightrope dance with imagination and put it into action. And I think, Ed, that's what we're hoping to do with the, with this circle. It's not just about talking. We have to all be working out what practically we're doing. And everyone that's joined us today, thank you for, 
doing that really tough intellectual muscle work to imagine, to stay hopeful, and then to put it into action in a really big set of um, systemic cogs and then to get up each day and to keep going is, is huge. So thank you, everybody, for all your time. And we'll finish with some highlights from the first Imagination Circle that we had three months ago when we kicked this off. And um, and then we'll keep rolling every three months to reclaim some time and space for us to imagine, um, centre that imagination, and then focus on the action that we're achieving through it. Thanks, everyone, for joining us on Imagination TV. I'm glad I didn't have too many traumatic responses to this garage again, and um, we'll see you all again soon. Thanks, Ed. You did a wonderful job, and thanks to the Learning Planet crew for um, bringing it together, and thanks very much to the AIM team behind the scenes, to Ehrman for doing so much wonderful work, and to Jacob and Penny for um, for having a late night here in Australia. We've got a pretty stuck end to the year, so I really appreciate the team that, that worked so hard to give us a stage to do this. So thank you, everybody. And Cheryl and Wangu, it's all yours next time. You're hosting in three months' time, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, gang. We'll see ya. Humanity is facing a number of different pressure points where we actually need imaginative thinking. We have 7 billion imaginations um, and, and, and this is what will, um, what will give us hope for a better world for sure. The starting point to imagine an alternative future is to realize that the only thing that travels faster than light is imagination. Let's start by imagining together what makes us human. How do we create the conditions to express our humanity? Imagination is a is a key kind of part of the route to empathy and also to you know find ways to engage with the sublime. It's about understanding imagination as the key to so many different doors. Over the past centuries, in my early years, I notably experienced life as an artist, a prisoner, a Buddhist monk, a junkie, a genius, a poetess, an assassin, a mother, and even a rabbit. This was pretty stimulating. I would love for all kids to experience as many lives as possible. I am 17 years old. Sometimes I myself wish that I had the imagination of a small child. A child does not think too much about the hardships of life, but rather build a world that he or she wants to see. You know, how do we imagine the best way to foster imagination? It's really a fundamental um, you know, concept for us as humans to have imagination. Imagination plays a really important role in how we look at the world and how we build our own future as well. What is that possible future? where we can, all of our societies can live peacefully. And what do we need to learn to actually become that kind of species that doesn't require violence to, to evolve? Can that be one of uh, key contributions of our imagination uh, capacity? That imaginative capacity to wander yourself into a path and then the energy to move is something that's critical. The unexpected can come out and what do we do to enable that to happen. Imagination in its simplest forms is playing with possibility. Let us imagine education as a big puzzle and each of us have different pieces of that puzzle. So if we connect all people together and they can share their puzzles, puzzle pieces, and then we can solve the whole puzzle. Allow them to really imagine what they can do for a better world and for a better future. That really allows them to take action, and that action gives them hope for the future. We are all about ensuring that every single person really is able to chart their own path of success. If you redefine and reimagine the idea of success to be thriving, then every child has the ability and the potential to succeed in their own way because they define their own success. What comes with imagination is ultimately creativity and without fear. There's something so truly transformative about being able to express ourselves deeply. It's in those moments of stillness when we reconnect with our most innermost feelings is where imagination gets activated.